I think that one of the greatest problems we have, and that has been analyzed in several books, actually, to explain the brain and to explain human beings is language. Language is a filter. And it's not very good to describe uh, neurophysiological phenomena, because our language is very categorical, and it classifies things. It tends to classify objects and everything. We do not have words and syntax to describe statistical events or emergent properties that come from the brain, from the interaction of um, billions of cells. So our thoughts can, it's very difficult to express them in language. And no wonder that we give such a, a reward to writers and poet, poets that can express our feelings so you know, well. Few of us can do that. I think the word soul, it depends what you define by soul. You know, if you're defining that as a mystical aura that is outside the body, or, or you know, I, I cannot measure that. I cannot, cannot talk about something that I cannot, unfortunately, quantify. If you're talking about soul as human nature, you know, the sort of the ranks or the rank or the spectrum of behaviors and reactions that we know humans produce under certain circumstances, uh, that is measurable, and that can be uh, uh, believed uh, in terms of neurophysiology as one more of these emergent properties that come by the interactions of these billions of cells in which the sum of the parts is much bigger than the individual elements. You know, as an emergent concept, uh, I can tell you that, uh, and in fact, there are a lot of people measuring long distance effects in the brain, uh, measuring magnetic fields. Mm -hmm. Because we know now that you can have an influence of this group of cells here on the front of our brain, and some of these influences may be faster than what we calculated by the transmission through nerves and the wonders that people have been wondering if a magnetic field generated back here, let's say, would be influencing much faster uh, no, the cells in the front of the, of the brain. So that kind of emergent property uh, has been the focus of a lot of, of, of work. God, for me, is exactly what I was trying to mention uh, on, 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 when I discussed the possibility that the brain needs to have a story it needs to have a logical uh, uh, screenplay, you know, telling where we come from and what we're going to. Uh, some people think that we came from the Big Bang. I'm one of them. Uh, others think that the Big Bang is named God. And others think that, no, there is, a, there is someone 35,000 feet up there governing the whole universe. It's, for me, this is a proof that the brain is trying to create uh, a, a, a story. And each one of us will take what is, you know, uh, the personal story or the personal biology of that person fits as the best explanation. So that's the reason I, I, I respect all these potential explanations. I have my own. Uh, and, uh, but that's how I see it. So I could not claim that we are avatars of God. I don't have any proof of that. I'm, I'm a big believer in Buddhism, but not so much as a religion, but as a way of life. And to me, I guess it's called a religion, but to me, Buddhism is, was really based in, with a human beginning, not a deity. I may be wrong, but that's my interpretation of it. Yeah, I, I think in that sense, what I like about uh, Buddhism and other uh, Eastern uh, versions of cosmology is that I was once in, in, in Japan, and one of my friends took us to a, to a temple. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I, read some, I, I heard something from uh, someone there that I never forgot. And the person said, you know, we all try to study the physics of the universe, the Big Bang, the elementary particles. But the universe for us only had meaning when we actually could talk about the universe, when we could look at it. We could actually create theories about it. The universe is what we carry in our brains. Yeah. 